I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he is thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Let's pray. We thank you, O God, that you are indeed a God who acts in history and time to accomplish his purposes. You judge the earth, and you deliver your people. We praise you as a man of war, one who fights on behalf of your elect. We pray this morning that you would defend us from all evil and harm, and strengthen us in our spiritual warfare, that we might be to your glory and praise in advancing your kingdom in this world. We pray for your blessing on our fellowship this morning and our worship. We pray that you would bless your word in our midst, that we would grow in Christ and be more equipped to serve him. We ask for your blessing on our uh, worship this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand, or continue to stand and sing our opening hymn. Let all things now living, a hymn of thanksgiving. Remember 125 of the other red hymn.
are at question number 32. And in some respects, this question and its answer is a transitory uh, question and answer. It really sets up the uh, table for uh, a handful of questions that are to follow. So uh, I do think, however, that we can make some comments on this that will be helpful and encouraging. So we're looking at God's effectual call. We talked about God's effectual calling last time. Uh, when God calls us to Christ, uh, He speaks a powerful word. That very same word is that which created the heavens and the earth. It's the word that has uh, brought Christ up from the dead. And it is the word that speaks to us, calling us to new life through Jesus Christ. And so it is a powerful, effectual call. One cannot but think that when God speaks, things must happen. He is the almighty, all-wise, and good God. So his call is effectual. We'll look at then this morning, question 32, which reads, What benefits do they that are effectually called partake of in this life? The answer is, they that are effectually called do in this life partake of justification, adoption, and sanctification, and the several benefits which in this life do either accompany or flow from them. So in considering the effectual call of God, we noted that it is the work of the Spirit of God who, uh, in consistency with the will of the Father and the work of the Son, the Spirit speaks that word to us, calling us from death to life, producing a, a new birth within us, replacing our heart of stone with a heart of flesh, and thereby enabling us to live for God. And so He actually calls us to Christ. And this call to Christ is a call to grace, to manifestation of God's unmerited favor. And that grace is what fills our hearts and minds when we come to Christ. We see that in Christ our sins are forgiven. In Christ we have a new record before God. In Christ we are enabled then to live a new life. And in Christ we uh, cry out to God as our Father. And so the, the catechism here emphasizes the, the powerful effect of God's call in the gospel message that accomplishes many things for us. Uh, it's not really an, an invitation to consider Christ, an invitation to consider the message of the gospel, but it affects certain things in our hearts, in our experience, in our spiritual life. And uh, there are three that come into view here, which we'll consider in the weeks to come. But each of them are uh, different aspects of our union with Christ. And so as we are called to Christ, joined to Him by a living faith, we have in Him our justification, adoption, and sanctification. Now we'll consider these in more detail in the weeks to come. But we want to note the relationship between God's effectual call and these different aspects of our salvation. Uh, God calls us to justification. He calls us to receive the forgiveness of sins through faith in Christ and His death on the cross. And so effectual calling points us to the work of a mediator who obtains that forgiveness for us by the substitution of Himself for us. And so we are called to this Christ who as our mediator atones for our sins and cleanses our record of all the, the corruption, guilt, and, and power of sin. And so uh, that is one part of the Spirit's ministry. And then he calls us to adoption. Excuse me, I, I should back up for a moment. With regard to justification, there is a cleansing of sin, but we are also called to the reception by faith of the righteousness of Christ. Uh, we so often neglect that aspect of our salvation. We think so much about the forgiveness of our sins and the removal of our guilt, and then we think that all is well. But no, we need to have 
a righteousness, a positive righteousness to stand before God to be accepted in His sight. It's not sufficient to simply wipe away our sins and, as it were, set us on a new path, give us a gentle push and say, okay, now do some good things. We'll never be able to provide the righteousness that satisfies God's law or that merits a reward. And so we have the righteousness of Christ given to us in the gospel message. It is that righteousness that is imputed to us, that we receive through faith. And the call of the Spirit is to receive this righteousness, to embrace it, to understand that our uh, old uh, polluted clothing is taken away and we are dressed anew in the righteous garments of Christ. And so we can enter into the wedding feast of the Lamb uh, with the wedding garments that are pleasing to Him. Next, we're called to adoption. This is... Uh, an advance beyond justification. Justification is we're in a right standing before God as His creatures. But now we enter into the very family of God. We have a, a loving relationship with God such that He has become our Father in Christ. We are adopted as His children. Christ is our elder brother. And so we are all members of this great family with God's name being placed upon us. And so when the gospel comes to us, it calls us to a living relationship with God as our Father. He's not an abstract deity. He's not some uh, prime mover or uh, some uh, unmoved, or excuse me, uh, a principle, an abstract principle of life, but rather He is our Father. And so He tenderly cares for us, provides for us, protects us, if that is the case, then that assures us that we are secure in Christ. We are members of His family. If, as Paul says in Romans 5, uh, while we were enemies, Christ died for us, how much more, since we've been reconciled, will God also um, lavish His love upon us? So, we have this benefit of adoption through our effectual calling, the, the ministry of the gospel will cause us to a relationship to God as our Father. And that uh, brings into our lives a whole new relationship with God. He's not a stranger. He's uh, not simply a friend. He's our Father. And Christ is our brother. And then finally, effectual calling effects or brings the benefit of our sanctification. Uh, that is our set, being set aside for God and for His purposes so that we might be set apart from the rest of this world as we'll see a little bit here later this morning. <coughs> but we are set aside to God and given over to the work of the Spirit, the continuing work of God's Word in our midst to sanctify our hearts and minds and make us more and more like Christ. Sanctification uh, increases our conformity to the image of Christ. We've been joined to Christ, and now we're being made in His likeness and in His image. And that is reflected in a, a more faithful obedience to God and to His Word, a living in fellowship with God, and ultimately our glorification. And so you see in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, uh, Paul talks about uh, how uh, those whom He predestined, these He also called, whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. The one follows after the other. And so there's this effectual call of the Spirit of God, and all of those then are justified. None are lost, none are missed by the call, but all who are called are justified, and all who are justified are glorified. The glorification includes our sanctification and ultimate uh, perfection. And so we see that how the effectual call of God brings all of these things into view. And uh, you can look at some of these other texts of Scripture as well in supporting that. We'll look at these in, in more detail, Lord willing, in the weeks to come. Let's turn to our Heavenly Father and bring our request to Him in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we have entered into your family through adoption. 
We have forfeited our rights by our sin. We lost our standing before you as your children through our sin with Adam. But you've been pleased to adopt us, to set us free from our bondage to evil and to sin, and to bring us into your very family. You've placed your name upon us. You've given us Christ as our older brother. And we pray, Father, that you would minister to our earthly needs. We bring our request to you in prayer this morning, uh, thanking you for your love and for your faithfulness in taking care of us. And we do pray for your continued provision for us and for our needs. Father, we pray that you would be with uh, those who need your healing hand today. I think of my sister-in-law, Barb, and for the uh, pain that she has been experiencing through this inflammation in her spine. I pray, Lord, that if it be your will, you would be pleased to bring her healing and help, relief, and new health. I thank you for her husband, George, and for the family. I pray that you would strengthen them as they help and take care of her. We pray for your blessing on her. Father, we pray for Heidi. We thank you for her successful surgery. And we do pray that you would bring her relief from pain and discomfort. We pray, Lord, that you would bless her with healing and renew health and strength. We pray that you would bless her school year. And under these challenging times, we pray, Lord, that this would be a time of tremendous blessing. Uh, where she is able to minister to her uh, classes in new ways, in ways that stretch, expand, and, and help each of her students. Father, we thank you for uh, your care for Chrissy and pray that as she un undergoes um, uh, radiation therapy in the weeks to come, that your uh, hand would be upon her to protect her in her travels and to bless these treatments they would be effective for her. And we pray too that as she undergoes surgery at a future point in time, that that too would uh, be blessed and be helpful for her. We thank you for her and for her good spirits. We thank you for Mike, her husband, and pray for your spirits work in their lives, for your blessing and your grace uh, for them. We pray for Joe as well. Thank you for his fellowship and pray for your blessing on him. Uh, we pray that you would be with Roselyn, uh, we thank you, Lord, for your uh, care for her. Pray that as she faces uh, chemotherapy, that you would uphold her and strengthen her and bless her. We pray that uh, you would bring salvation to her and her husband. Uh, we pray for your blessing on them. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would be with uh, Rick's mother, Betty uh, Gibson. We thank you, Lord, for secure place for her to stay, but we do pray that uh, you would restore her strength, renew her health. We pray, Lord, that she would be able to put on uh, the weight that she needs to have, and we pray that you would uh, bless her with uh, a provision of uh, good food that would be appetizing and helpful to her. And pray that you would watch over her in terms of perhaps a future uh, in, in another location but we do pray for your blessing and provision for her. We pray for Lois and her family, for the Rawlings family, and for all those who uh, mourn the loss of Margaret Rawlings. We thank you, Lord, for her life. We thank you for the work of grace that has been evident in her, for her trust in you as her Savior, and her uh, effort to uh, serve you by loving her daughters and watching over her family, her sons, and we pray, Lord, for your blessing on her. Uh, we pray that you would be with uh, the family as they grieve, and pray that you would give them comfort and strength. We thank you that when we pass from this life, we enter immediately into your presence with joy and thanksgiving to enjoy, rejoice in the salvation of your people. We thank you that even now she is in the great company of your elect gathering in heaven. What a wonderful thing. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on us as we look forward to that day as well. Uh, protect us from harm and evil and help us to continue in faith. We pray then for our elderly. Pray that you would sustain and strengthen them. Be with George and Ella, with Larry and with uh, Eve. We pray, Lord, that you would watch over them. Be with uh, Matthew.
Manny and uh, Rhoda. Uh, we pray for Kathy and her husband John. And for others who are advancing in age, we pray, Lord, that you would watch over each one and secure them in Christ. Uh, we pray for your blessing on our health and our situation. Be with uh, Tim and his family. And uh, I pray that you would watch over his health and strengthen him. Uh, provide for him uh, through the medical care that he receives. And Lord, we just pray that you would watch over each of us and strengthen us as we serve you. We pray for our country. We pray that you would deliver us from evil. Uh, bless our leaders. That they would do that which is righteous and good. We pray, Lord, for the advance of truth in our culture. We pray that you would deliver us from lies and for, from deceit. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to uh, be careful with the things that we say, that we would uh, speak that which is right and good, and think of what is for the betterment of our country. We pray that you would provide us with um, faithful justices who serve on our courts. We pray for Amy Coney. Uh, Barrett, that as she uh, undergoes this uh, process of evaluation and then hopefully is installed as a justice, we pray for your blessing on her and her labors. We pray that you would keep her and her family from harm, from reproach. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, strengthen them for this time. We thank you for those who serve in our churches. We pray for our pastors and elders, deacons. We pray for teachers who serve in a variety of capacities in our Sunday schools. and We pray, Lord, for your blessing on the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, that you would cause its ministry to flourish and grow. We pray you, your blessing on our local congregation. We thank you for each other, for our fellowship in Christ, and ask you to teach, teach us to grow in love, in compassion, in grace, in kindness, and pray that you will be glorified in us, in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God, uh, let's join together to pray, making use of the words that our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. This time we'll return to our next hymn, Come to the Savior Now. It's 475 if you happen to have a red Trinity hymn on. <laughs>
continuing our reading from the book of Genesis, and we're in the 31st chapter today. Uh, this uh, narrative extends for, I think, 55 verses all together. We're looking at the first 24 verses. Uh, I think that will be the focus of our attention this morning. Um, so it may be that we'll uh, get to the uh, balance of the text uh, next time, next, next week, we're willing. But today we'll look at the first 24 verses of chapter 31. Now Jacob heard that the sons of Laban were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what was our father's he has gained all this wealth. Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his flock was, and said to them, I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before, but the God of my father has seen, has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. God did not permit him to harm me. If he said, The spotted shall be your wages, then all the flock were spotted. And if he said, The striped shall be your wages, then all the flock were striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. In the breeding season of the flock, I lifted up my eyes and I saw in a dream that the goats that mated with the flock were striped, spotted, and mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift up your eyes and see. All the goats that mate with the flock are striped, spotted, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now, arise, go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us, and he has indeed devoured our money. All the wealth that God has taken away from our Father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do. So Jacob arose and set his sons and his wives on camels. He drove away all his livestock, all his property that he had gained, the livestock and his possession that he had acquired in Padan Aram, to go to the land of Canaan, to his father Isaac. Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household gods. And Jacob tricked Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him that he intended to flee. He fled with all that he had, and arose and crossed the Euphrates, and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. When it was told of Laban on the third day that Jacob had fled, he took his kinsmen with him and pursued him for seven days, and followed close after him into the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream by night, and said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. We'll finish our reading here. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for your word, and we pray that your spirit would bless uh, this message to our hearts. We pray that you would help us to see uh, 
your work in our world today and what you call us to do uh, in these times. Bless your word and the, uh, our hearts through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I've been reading a, a small book on the development of socialism and communism across Western cultures. And the argument is that socialism is something of a precursor for communism, the conditions of a culture to move steadily, slowly, gradually uh, to a point of accepting a communist world point of view. And so in uh, socialism, you have uh, the government stepping in and providing all kinds of social services here and there, gradually working its way into different aspects of our culture, into the lives of families and individuals, all with a smile, all ready to help you and uh, provide for you. Uh, but it, it's conditioning you like the, the frog in the pot with the heat turned on and gradually the temperature getting hotter and hotter it is conditioning you to the point where you will accept the, the control of the state over all of life. For the sake of security, for the sake of uh, your uh, daily food. You'll surrender your liberties and accept the government's control because the government, after all, has your best interests at heart. Well, it occurs that back in the 1960s, a lot of uh, act, uh, excuse me, a lot of uh, artists, uh, intellectuals, philosophers, those who were enamored with communism as it was being practiced in Red China and the Soviet Union would travel to these distant places, to Moscow and Beijing and elsewhere, to observe the wonders of communism. And what would happen is that the communists would arrange, if you will, something of a stage play for these American tourists who would come in, and they would show them what a communist society is like. They would show them what they want them to see. Model schools, people uh, living comfortably, uh, all kinds of medical care for everyone, and so everything looked to be something of a worker's paradise. But they didn't let you see the ugly backside of communism, where those who were in, in descent to the rule of the government uh, were uh, put off in the hospitals for, for schools for re education, uh, for uh, training, perhaps even sent off to gulags uh, for uh, forced labor, and finally, even you have in communist countries, those who could not be manipulated or changed, they would be executed. Communism is responsible for the deaths of millions of its own citizens. If you don't follow their way of thinking, then there's no place for you. This is the advance of tyranny. It is the advance of a, a government that seeks to subdue, control, and overwhelm its people. It's this very kind of thing that our early American fathers resisted when they composed their Declaration of Independence. In that declaration where they say that uh, we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, which include the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they went on to note that when it comes time when a government oppresses its people and intends to uh, subdue them and to in, in, impoverish them, then it's the right of a free people to resist that government. And so the Declaration of, an in, of Independence then goes on to cite all the different ways in which King George had purposefully intended to dispossess and indeed oppress the American colonies. And then they declare uh, their determination that the, the colonies would be a free and independent country. Why do I bring this bit of a history lesson before you? Well, the story that we have developing here under Jacob is a story that has certain elements within it 
that bear the markers of a kind of oppressive circumstance. Now, admittedly, it's only in elementary format within the family life. But you have Jacob working for Laban, and Laban oppressing Jacob, changing his wages time and time again. Jacob says, he changed my wages ten times. That's probably something of a, a, a euphemism for saying, he, he's done it so much that uh, I, I've had it. That's the end of it. And so Laban was oppressing Jacob, not allowing him to prosper. Every time Jacob was successful in one thing, raising uh, sheep that were spotted, Laban changed the rules and uh, gave him the striped sheep. And every, at every turn, Laban was dispossessing Jacob. And so he was, Jacob was under oppression. You see as well, at, at the beginning of the chapter, Jacob learns that the sons of Laban were uh, very upset with him. They thought in their minds that Jacob was uh, stealing their property. After all, the flocks originally belonged to their father Laban. And they seem to inherit these flocks. And here is Jacob, this interloper, coming in. And he is, through the science of animal husbandry, through revelation from God, uh, through God's blessing, he is advancing his flocks and getting wealthier and wealthier. Now, these sons of Laban were looking upon Jacob with envy. How is it that this guy, who's no different from us, is doing so well, and we are struggling to survive? And so there was envy of the wealthy, and a hostility towards them, as though there's something going on here that's wrong. Do we not see the echoes of that in our culture today, where we want to tax the rich and make them pay their fair share and redistribute the wealth to the poor? Because after all, the rich are making the wealth on the backs of the poor, no their labor. And so there's this envy of those who are successful in this world and the desire to repress them, to take that which they have in different ways. And so the sons of Laban consider that they have been uh, done harm by Jacob. There is no offense here. And they feel like they need to rectify it. So you have the development of a culture of grievance. A culture that uh, feels wrong and wishes to rectify it. He cries out, no justice no peace. And so it is with Laban. Jacob learns that Laban no longer looks on Jacob with favor anymore. You see uh, this referred to a couple of times in the text where Laban once looked upon Jacob as a great benefit to him because he was so successful in taking care of Laban's flocks. When finally Jacob got to the point where he said, I've got to take care of my own family now. And then you began to see how the blessing of God was upon Jacob and his family and his flocks, but Laban's flocks began to fall apart. And, and, and in part, that's because of the mindset of Laban and his, uh, his sons. They were rapacious. They were taking those things from Jacob and uh, trying to profit off of his work rather than doing the work themselves. In any case, Jacob looks upon Laban and sees that now Laban himself is hostile to Jacob and something has to change. And it's at this moment that uh, Moses records that God spoke to Jacob and said to him that you are to now get up and go back to the land of your fathers and I will be with you and bless you there. And so in the midst of this uh, time of oppression, of deception, of theft of property, and so forth, we find God comes to his servant Jacob and rescues him. God reveals his purpose to his servant. How 
important it is that we listen to what God has to say to us in these times of oppression, these times of attack against a culture that has benefited from the Christian faith, the establishment of uh, strong families within the culture, and uh, the capitalistic system which reflects uh, the Ten Commandments, particularly, Thou shalt not steal. That command, you shall not steal, lays the foundation for the right to private property and to the advance of a capitalistic worldview. And so uh, the, the development of a Christian culture, by and large, has great, granted great prosperity to our country, but those who do not participate in that have been seeking refuge in communism and advancing that sort of thing in our culture today. Well, we see the, the development of these things, and it seems to me that as we look at the unfolding of this story, that we are finding how Moses is tailoring the story to tell us a lot about uh, Israel themselves and what God is doing for Israel. We made note of this last time as well. There were certain elements of the story uh, of Jacob that pointed to the exodus from Egypt. Now God listened to his people. If you look at uh, Exodus chapter 3, you find that God meets with uh, Moses on the mountain. And God says to him, I've heard, I've seen the oppression of my people, and I've heard their cries for deliverance. And I've come to call them out. It's the same kind of thing that you have here in Genesis 31, where God sees what's happening to Jacob. He sees how his wages have been changed time and time again, and he's being oppressed. And God has come to act on Jacob's behalf and deliver him. And so Moses comes to Israel and says, You see, God, the God of Jacob, is the God of Israel. He's the God who sees your oppression. And he comes to answer and to help and to deliver. Now, the scriptures are not so much concerned about political liberation or the prosperity of God's people in terms of earthly material things. All of that is good. But there are greater issues in mind here. This deliverance from uh, Laban uh, has its uh, antitype in the the deliverance of Israel from Egypt, but all of that as well points us to a greater deliverance yet to come. We'll talk about that as we develop our story here. But all of these things uh, come together to speak to us today They call us to a life of faith and of listening to the Word of God. Uh, so God speaks to Jacob, and then Jacob calls for his wives. Uh, Rachel and Leah, to gather to him out in the field where he can talk to them in private and not have his conversation heard by others and discuss what God has said to him and what his plans were to uh, inform them of the circumstances of how he's being treated by the father of Laban and to win their support for a return back to the land of Canaan. He needed to have them informed. He needed them to understand the circumstances and empower them to act. And so uh, Jacob tells them uh, the history of his dealings with Laban, how Laban has turned in, in hostility towards them. And, uh, and then he explains how God himself was with Jacob and blessed all that he had done. And he relates to them a dream that he had while the sheep and the goats were making uh, by the, the water bags there. He has this dream where he sees these bottled uh, and, and uh, striped and spotted goats mating with the flock. And then an angel of the Lord, who it seems to me is the, the pre incarnate Christ, who comes in this theophany, the angel of the covenant who we'll see more and more in Old Covenant history. He comes to uh, Jacob in dream form and says to him that I am the God 
of Bethel. I am the God who will appear to you. Remember the, the vision that uh, Jacob had of the ladder between heaven and earth and the angels of God ascending and descending on that. And we saw that as a picture of Christ the mediator through whom the blessings of God come down upon us. And so here this angel of the covenant takes Jacob back to some time ago, some 20 years ago, when Jacob met the Lord at Bethel. And he reminds Jacob of his vows to follow him, to serve him. And he shows Jacob how he has blessed and prospered him. But now it is time to come back home. And so the God of Bethel, the angel of the covenant, uh, calls Jacob to return home. You'll notice here that when God speaks to Jacob, uh, Jacob responds uh, with uh, faith and with submission. He says, here am I. The angel speaks to him by name, Jacob, and he says, here am I. Here I am. This should be the posture that we all have when God speaks to us, whether it comes through dream form, as it did to Jacob long ago, or through his written word, as we read that word for ourselves from time to time, morning devotions, uh, Sunday school, church services, or when God speaks through the ministry of his word, through pastors and teachers who apply that word to our hearts and minds, when God speaks to us his word, the proper response is, here I am. We present ourselves to God, ready for his service. And we are submissive to what he has to say. We are alert. We want to hear what he has to say because it is of vital interest to us. Do you have that posture when God is addressing you from his word? You are ready to hear the answer that he has to say. Here I am. And be mindful as well that God spoke to Jacob in particular. The word of God, yes, in the preaching service is generally given in a general form to the saints of God. I don't call out special individuals and say, you need to do this and that. Someday maybe I should, but uh, that would probably not go over very well. <laughs> but in any case, the word of God comes to each of us by his spirit and addresses us personally. And I think you find that there are times when it's as though the word strikes you with a hot iron. And all of a sudden you're exposed to God and your hearts are open to Him and you say, yes! This needs to change. Yes, I believe that about Christ. Yes, His Word is true. So the Word of God comes and speaks powerfully to us. He calls us by name. He knows us individually. And He has a word for each of us. And so we have this message that Jacob relates to his wives and they agree with him that uh, they have been mistreated. They uh, two side themselves with Jacob in obedience to the word of God. And so they commit themselves to the course of action that Jacob proposes. They come alongside. We have here, it seems to me, uh, a, a kind of, if you will, a household salvation. You have a covenant household here responding to the word of God. It addresses Jacob, but includes his whole household. And they individually respond to that word for themselves. And so Rachel and Leah, and you might notice the uh, arrangement of the names here, it's Rachel first, and then Leah. It seems that Rachel takes the lead here in uh, being committed to this a path that uh, Jacob has uh, presented to them, that, that God himself has presented to them. But anyway, you have them coming alongside their husband to follow after him in obedience to God. How much of a blessing it is within homes and families when the whole household comes together and says, we will serve the Lord Jesus Christ. 
we will walk in covenant with him and follow after him. Uh, what a blessing that is. And so they come alongside and uh, then Jacob gathers his family, gathers his possessions, and then uh, when there's an opportune time when Laban is out in the field shearing the sheep, and there's uh, a lot involved in that, I guess to do that you have to get away from the campsite, get away from the home, get some distance away, shear the sheep that are out in the field, and while Laban is involved in that, Jacob decides it's his opportunity to flee, and he takes off. All this family head for about a 350 mile journey to Gilead, crossing the Euphrates River and making their way to the land of Canaan. It's a flight from tyranny, a flight from oppression. It's a search for liberty and for blessing. And they come to Gilead under God's guidance and direction. Laban, on the other hand, like Pharaoh of old, when Israel left Egypt and went on their way to the land of Canaan, Pharaoh roused his armies and ran off in pursuit after Israel. And so, similarly, Laban gets his family together, uh, they get armed, and off they go in uh, hot pursuit after Jacob. Again, another picture of uh, the exodus from Egypt and the oppression that Israel would suffer under Egypt and the greater oppression of spiritual darkness and evil at work in the world. And so, Laban comes after Jacob, and in the course of trying to approach Jacob, God appears to him in a dream. It's like when, when Israel comes to uh, the, the banks of the water, and they got the water behind them, they got Pharaoh coming after them, what are they to do? Well, it was at that time the angel of the covenant comes and says to Moses, lift up your hands and the waters divide and the people go across and the angel of the covenant stands between them and the armies of Pharaoh. The Lord comes to, to, to Laban and says to him, you will not speak anything good or bad to Jacob. Nothing good in such a way as to try to uh, win them back and bring them back peacefully under promises of well-being. And so um, God wants them to stay there in the land of Canaan and not be tempted to go back and not to speak anything bad, not to threaten them, not to do any harm to them. God is their protector. And he's going to set up a barrier here between Jacob and his family and Laban and this family. And we'll see at the conclusion of the story that an altar or a memorial is set up Dividing the two camps from each other. And I think we'll see as we go along here that this whole experience prepared Jacob for what was yet ahead when he has his brother Esau coming after him again. So it's out of the frying pan and into the fire coming up, although Jacob does not realize that just yet. God uses our circumstances in life to prepare us for greater things and for greater challenges. Life. And so uh, God warns Laban not to say anything bad to uh, Jacob. And, and what is uh, alarming is that while Jacob left the camp uh, under cover of darkness, if you will, uh, and, and uh, flees, Rachel picks up some of the household idols. And this is going to be a, a real problem, as we'll see later on next time. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know what her motivation for this was, but it may be that she had still some allegiance to these idols, to these gods, and felt that they provided some measure of power and protection for her. And you recall that when Israel left Egypt, there were some who still had the, the gods of Egypt with them. And indeed, uh, Aaron built a cat and urge the people to worship this calf. There's still this allegiance to these foreign gods. And when we are delivered from sin, Satan, when we are brought to Christ, we need to be sure that we let go of all the idols in our hearts and our lives. Abandon them. Let them go. 
that we might follow the Lord freely and not suffer harm. In any case, we'll come to that Lord really next time. But what we have here is the Spirit of God showing us this great deliverance from oppression, anticipating the deliverance from Egypt, but what is more, pointing ahead to a greater deliverance for all of us. Isaiah would say in his 53rd chapter that the, the suffering servant of the Lord is one who suffered oppression and affliction. And by oppression, he was led away. And whereas Jacob would be delivered from that oppression and not suffer death, this one would be silent like a lamb is before his shearers. And this one would be sacrificed. And so when we come into the New Testament, Testament and we see Jesus before Pontius Pilate, what happens? Well, first of all, we know that it was because of envy that he was turned over to Pontius Pilate. The Pharisees and the scribes were envious of the crowds and the support that Jesus had. And so they felt that they were going to lose control of what they considered to be their inheritance, the nation of Israel. And so they were hostile to Jesus. And so the very uh, family in which Jesus was in, the family of Israel, his own brethren, were after him to kill him. And when Jesus stands before Pontius Pilate, you can read about this in Matthew 27, um, Pilate knows that it was because of envy that Jesus, Jesus was delivered up to them. And so the very little elements of the envy of Laban's sons here against Jacob pointed ahead to the envy that would come against the cross and the oppression that he himself would suffer from them. And ultimately, the Christ would suffer and die. But just as God saw Jacob, heard his circumstances, and rendered him aid, so also God would raise Jesus from the dead, triumphing over sin and Satan. That evil one who is behind Laban, behind Pharaoh, Satan who is at work in the kingdom of darkness, a kingdom of tyranny and oppression. He creates a kingdom of bondage where you have certain entertainments and, and, and things for a period of time, worldly pleasures and these kinds of things. But eventually, if God is at work in your life, you will see how empty those things are, how shallow they are, and how oppressed you are, and you will want to be rescued and delivered. And that is what Christ does for each of us when he rescues us from the kingdom of darkness and brings us into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God's own Son. We are set free from the changing of our wages, the, the uh, ever-increasing entertainments that continue to fail to satisfy, the pleasures, the, the fame, and so forth, all, all the activities of life that are empty. They're shallow. And ultimately, we find that they are oppressive. That God in Christ comes to deliver us from these things and to give us a new life. And so what we have here is the God of battle. The God who appeared to Jacob long ago, revealing the fact that he is present with Jacob to bless him. And he will go with him wherever he goes when he goes back to the land of Canaan. How grateful we should be that God has delivered us from tyranny. Greater tyranny than political oppression, economic hardship, all these kinds of things. Spiritual oppression. Guilt, emptiness, loneliness, corruption, judgment, and death. He set us free through the Christ who appeared to Jacob long ago. Let's pray. Father, we pray that your spirit would bless your word to our hearts and help us to see the work of Christ in our hearts and lives, how we are delivered from a greater oppression in the darkness of sin and bondage to death. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would open the eyes of some this day who may yet be in that domain of darkness and death, 
You do not perceive the chains in their hands and their feet. You do not understand that they are being led to slaughter to death. We pray, Lord, that you would awaken them to their condition. And we pray that you would set them free by the power of the gospel, by the power of your effectual calling. We pray, Lord, that you would bless those of us who have been set free, that you would strengthen us to know that you are present with us, and even in times of affliction and trouble and distress, you are with us, and you will provide for us. Help us to live by faith and to trust in your care for us. We ask for your blessing on us through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
through Christ. We are freed from that sentence of condemnation. Uh, in our catechism lesson this morning, there's an emphasis on the benefits that we have in this life. Justification, adoption, sanctification. God's blessings are for you here and now, and not just something off into a distant future. Well, our final hymn is now, Israel may say that in truth. Uh, it's hymn number 614 in the Great Trinity.